I'm sat in Darwin, Blackburn. Darwin, Blackburn with Darwin. Yes, but in Blackburn now. All right, yes. With Fraser Cropper here at Totally Wicked headquarters. Um, and I just wanted to talk to you about the challenge to the Tobacco Products Directive Article 20 that's coming up. Before I ask you anything, I want to firstly shake you by the hand and say sure. congratulations for doing it. Okay. Thank you. Um, how do you see it going? Have we got any further with timescales? Mm. And when is it going to be successful? I think that's the big question because I feel it is going to be successful. Well, I know it's going to be successful. It has to be successful. Not because it has to be because I want it to be. It has to be because it has to be because the arguments are so obvious. Mm. So it will be successful. Um, when will it be successful? Sometime this year. Uh, the provisional estimate is that sometime in probably late third quarter early winter of 2015 then we will have our day in court and there will be a ruling. Uh, the challenge will be of course that we've got to make sure that's not a pyrrhic achievement so very well to be successful in the court what did it leave behind Yes. and how do we find ourselves at the end of this year making sure that whatever has happened in that period between now and then actually doesn't undermine the overall intent of us being successful which is for us to ultimately uh, achieve a victory which allows us to start again and, and revisit the key question which is how should these products be regulated properly. Yes because patently the TPD when last it was looked at got it so badly wrong in all kinds of different measures. They did, yeah. Um, so as, as and when this, this victory goes through the court and like you I'm, I've looked at all of the paperwork and I can't see it failing mm. because the logic is inescapable, the science mm. is inescapable. When it comes to recast whether it be as part of the Tobacco Products Directive or whether it is recast as a separate directive altogether to deal with probably not just e-cigs but all the nicotine containing products. How do you see or how do you feel that regulation ought to occur? What, what's the primary focus for you? Well the primary focus for us would be as a company and I think also as I hope um, an ambassador for the consumers because I think the synergistic really. If we're a company that's able to sell the range of products we want and be successful then we have to meet the customer's needs. They're one and the same. Um, so if we are and when we're successful then we need to leave behind a legacy which is a framework that allows for new regulation to be put into place which reflects the ability for companies like ours to be able to continue to innovate and support customers needs such that the pace of development that we've seen remarkably in this sector in the past five years continues. Yes. And we produce a range of products and a sector that matures into something we can all be proud of and that allows for consumers who have been on the sidelines equivocating whether they should use e-cigarettes because of all this misinformation to come on board and to find these products that you've found and many other millions have found. Uh, and that's a great tragedy of what's happened over the past three or four years, that misinformation campaign has probably caused people's lives to be lost prematurely because they've not had the confidence to be able to move in the direction that you, free thinking people like yourself, have done, which is to find by your own volition and your own research the products that you now use routinely. It's, it's an interesting point that you bring up because I was speaking to Robert West a couple of weeks ago um, and he's identified a downturn in the prevalence of ECs. Yeah. Have, you, have you seen that reflected in the business? Well, we've seen uh, 2014 being a uh, internally a year of regrouping really. Uh, there was a lot of momentum in the sector between 2010 and 2013. I think a lot of companies rode that wave. I think what happened last year was that there was a greater increase in the rate of product availability compared to the rate of increase of consumers and therefore consumers were having more choice and they were spending their monies in a less dense way, yes. and more profuse and more wide-ranging. So. Uh, I think most companies last year probably would have found it a year of uh, reconsideration of their business model. Um, and I'm not surprised that the consumers have waned in the past six months or so. Um, my hypothesis is that in the past three or four years, all those people, I mentioned that term free thinking, you know, people who take control of their own destiny mm. and don't need, to, don't need to be escorted to a decision, those people have probably already made that switch to e-cigarettes. Those people who are slightly more reserved, who need slightly more support in making those decisions, have probably stepped back from the brink of potentially engaging because of what's happened in the past year or so. Uh, and I do think that a positive campaign, a 
truly well-informed campaign could very well crystallise another two or three million people very quickly in the UK. Yes. Uh, and part of what the TPD has unfortunately not allowed is for that. And what has happened in the wake of the TPD and all the way before it is that for the media to have exploited that for whatever reason, just general vandalism, mm. um, misinformation because there's an agenda, uh, ignorance, but the compounded effect of all that is that people don't know what these products are. We know. Yes. Uh, I sell them in confidence that I know that I'm bringing no harm to anybody. Indeed, there's potentially many people's lives have been saved by our company and companies like ours some of the products that we sell. Uh, that's not generally understood there. It, it, is, uh, it is the downside of the way the British press particularly and, and the American academics seem to approach this that if there is a risk and according to what they've been saying over the last, let's just say even the last three weeks, mm. had all of these risk, risks been at the magnitude that they are implying, I should have been dead years ago. I'm coming up to six years in on these things. Yeah. and. It, it, it just pains me to see all of that coming through. What delights me um, is Totally Wicked's approach to this challenge, which I'm reading it as saying, look, everything you've heard from the naysayers is just so much rubbish. This is the truth. This is why Article 20 needs to be just taken out altogether mm. um, and, and I'm, as I've said earlier on I'm very very optimistic that that's going to be successful. Well so am I, I think the, the, the sector as a whole has been exploited because it is such a very fragmented and very junior industry mm. that you can walk all over it and you can misinform against it because it's got very little power. You know, we're actually a, a relatively modest business, um, there's businesses of our size and businesses which are larger than ours who've been unwilling and able, whatever the motivation is, to have done much at all apart from sit back and allow these things to happen. It's part of the legacy of my brother, influence on the business and the responsibility I feel that he gave to me to make sure that our business continues to reflect that initial personality of the business and the responsibilities that we've accepted on behalf of our customers. Mm. I wrote a blog for uh, Save E6 on Friday, which was published earlier this week, which caused him to reflect a little bit on why am I doing it? What's the purpose? What do I want to ultimately establish as a consequence of us being successful? Um, quite an unto catharsis, really, because they may look back more deeply into the business and what we're trying to do and why. And it is all about the customers. People mm. think it's trite, how dare you, Fraser, use that as your reason, your raison d'etre. Well, it is, because actually the customers don't have to buy from us. The customers can buy from whoever they want to. And if there are no customers, there's no business. Well, absolutely. And you know, we don't use any coercive tactics at all to sell our, business, our products, we don't market. There's been no market. When's the last time we saw a TW advert on, t on television or a radio? We don't market our products. We rely upon customers who come to us who like what we do to tell to other customers. That's why we service you know, 80, 90,000 people each, each, each month. Um, so we are doing this because we have to do it. We have to do it because there's a, a quid pro quo with our customers, which is if you trust us to give you the products and you exchange your money for the things that we sell, then I've got also a responsibility to use that money when I need to, to make sure that your requirements are fulfilled. Not just in the things that we can control, but in the things that we can't directly control, but can have, can have an influence on. Yes. That's the reason why uh, by the time it's finished, there'll be a, at least a seven figure sum spent by this business on, on legal costs. There's half of that spent already. Mm. Uh, and that's not insignificant for a business like ours. I'd rather be invested in the building you'll see later there, which is our new technical facility. Um, and perhaps I would have invested in that technical facility six months previously if I hadn't had my eyes turned in 2013 toward the shenanigans and the responsibilities that we shouldered in 2013 and beyond. Uh, so our business has been adversely affected. Uh, I, I don't doubt that. In 2013 when we basically turned over our site to six months to you know, Mr. Wicky with a guy force mask on and it being a, a, an outlay, an outpouring of stuff that we wanted our customers to get engaged with. Other vendors were selling e-cigarettes. Yes, uh, and, and it, it was a lost opportunity for us in the business. But I and all those people in the leadership position in the business agreed that it was the right thing for us to do, because there'll be no business in 2016 unless we did something. Yes. So there's no long-term business plan. So what's the point in fettling around for the first or for the next two years when ultimately you know you're going to hit a big cul-de-sac wall? Yes. So yes. that was the plan. The, the long-term plan is to build a, a, a business that can be trading in 30 years if we wanted to, with really strong founding underpins. And there was one big risk, that irrespective of what we do, whether we do right or wrong, irrespective of that, 
somebody would make a judgment on our business on our behalf legitimately. So we have to take the action. Yes. You, you've mentioned uh, other companies, some bigger, some smaller. What kind of action do you need them to take as far as this challenge is concerned? And then building on that, what action do we as consumers need to take, aside from just signing up to support? Okay, so we don't want a class act. Right. Uh, it's been confirmed with our barristers, uh, our barrister and our legal team that it would probably get in the way. Okay. Uh, trying to build a consensus will be quite difficult to achieve. It would delay yeah. and potentially delay to the point where actually we wouldn't get in front of a, a court in the time that we needed to. It allows it to be more clear with the arguments we're putting forward without having to worry about that, that collective coalescence of thoughts and ideas. Uh, and as long as we make sure that the ultimate end state that's provoked and achieved by this is consistent with the consumer needs, then we don't need any financial support or uh, any support from any um, like-minded industry participants. I think what we do need is for all those who share a concern, um, who want to be involved, to get involved and go back to where we were in the mid part of 2013 where there was such a, a wonderful outpouring of really spontaneous uh, but very passionate support for what was happening and people willing to get, get engaged with MEPs and MPs. I think there's a bit of a phony war going on, people believe it's all over, <laughs> yes. quite the contrary. Yes. But what we've seen, there's, there's, there's a very significant danger that even if we are successful at the end of this year, stuff would have happened that would have laid and cast a foundation which is consistent with what the TPD aspired to do. So we've got to get involved in making sure that all those bureaucrats who are now charged with implementing, both the European bureaucrats and public sector, public workers in the UK, people like the implementation team in the UK, we've got to make sure that they take their responsibilities properly and uh, don't blithely apply the TPD in national regulations and they listen to the objective evidence and the needs of the consumer industry. Those people are going to have to practically deliver this legislation and to understand just how fallacious parts of it are and how absolutely impractical and impossible it will be to deliver and to get them to become more reasonable about it as well. Win those people over by the objective evidence and the openness and willingness for us to deliver a regulation set that is sensible then I think we have a fighting chance as well. You could actually nullify the TPD by making it irrelevant because nobody trusts it. Yes. By getting all those people who invested the time in implementation and considering the practical matters of it to realise, well, it's just not going to happen. Mm. Even if it's simple, I'm going to ignore it because it's just ridiculous. Yes. Uh, what are the influences? Well, there's a lot of other influences that we've got to be very careful of. I don't mind big tobacco joining the sector. I've got no problems with that at all. If they can sell e-cigarettes, let them sell e-cigarettes. I do mind if there is a motivation for there to be um, a use of the regulation such that it constrains competition. And I think we probably are seeing uh, some of that influence being brought to bear such that it is potentially not in the best interest of the sector. I think people need to be eyes open to that, which is there are people now lobbying, engaging in that debate, influencing those people who are going to be implementing and influencing in a way which is not consistent with the vaping community, not the e-cigarette community, the vaping community, the people that you speak to today, the people that we try and serve, yeah. those people are not having the needs properly influenced into the people who are now going to judge and apply the regulation. And even if, as I said, the TPD is um, undermined and ultimately quashed by ourselves, there's a danger that the pent momentum built behind it will then deliver ultimately some regulation which is a, a spawn child of the TPD. We've got to stop that. So if I've got this right then, for everybody out there that's watching this, every consumer and indeed every small business, every bricks and mortar shop, you, if I've got this right, need to be talking to your MP and MEPs and going over again what seems like old ground. Yeah. The ground that we went through in 2013 and 2012 and 2011 and I've been going through since 2009. Um, there are briefing papers available. I hope by the time you see this, the latest one will have been published. That's a good starting point. Um, I'm going to bring this part of the interview to a close now and say again, I have nothing but respect for what you were doing. If I could snap my fingers and make it work yesterday, I would like a shot. I want to say a big, big thank you on behalf of every vapor in the UK. You and totally wicked for what you've done. Thanks, Dave. We'll try for the time being, Fraser. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, Dave.